All right. So the title of this talk is uh, Proper Seasoning Improves Taste. Um, my girlfriend's daughter is an aspiring chef, so we watch a lot, a lot of cooking sh shows. Um, we're also big foodies. If a new restaurant opens up in the area, we're going to go find out what the food's like. Um, and I love exploring uh, new taste sensations. But one of the basic fundamentals in food preparation is um, you need to have proper seasoning. So if you were to watch one of those shows on the Cooking Channel or the Food Network or TLC or whatever, you'll almost always see somebody like uh, you know, Robert Irvine or uh, Gordon Ramsay salt the food, put the salt in the food. You need proper seasoning for the food, right? Well, as a systems administrator, we need proper seasoning of our systems and our networks. We need to be have that planning. Um, how do we make this more palatable, more ed edible, more easily consumable for ourselves. We get inundated with uh, tons of information that we have to deal with on a daily basis and tons of situations. How do we make it a little more concise and the information we need more readily available? How do we make it taste better to ourselves at the end of the day? So who am I? I'm uh, Jim Siegel. I'm uh, at Wolflight on Twitter. Um, I'm a Marine. Uh, we're never former Marines. I'm a father. Um, happy Father's Day. I wanted to give a shout out to my kids who happen to watch the videos. Uh, I know it's Father's Day. I'm not there. Uh, I'm proud of every one of my sons and everything you guys do. I'm a concerned citizen, of course, um, and that's not just because I'm an American. I'm a concerned citizen in the security community. I think we need to do as much as we can to educate as many people as we can uh, in as many ways as we can. So I like to call myself an InfoSec evangelist. I've done that in a couple of talks. Um, obviously, I'm a systems administrator by day. I'm an InfoSec professional. I've done OSIP for penetration tests for Georgia. Um, I do whatever I can in my local community. I've mentioned in a couple of people's talks where I, I try and help my neighbors and local area businesses do whatever they can to improve their security posture because they don't have an IT department. So they don't have those, those resources. Obviously, I'm a speaker here at CCDC. I didn't put up all the other ones. I didn't do like a Jason Street. I love Jason. I didn't bring like all the badges from all the content entry because that's not relevant. What's relevant today is this talk here. Um, and while I've seen some of you at other cons, and I'll see some of you at other cons, um, this is the con today. So <clears throat> what are the major issues that systems administrators deal with on a regular basis? I boil them down to these five key fundamentals. Secure logins, configuration management, change management, handling multiple systems, and remediation of an unauthorized or accidental system change. So there's all kinds of solutions out there for, for administrators, right? So, and I use most of them. You've got a sim. It's monitoring the activities in your network and on your systems. You've got log management tools. You got all kinds of stuff. You know, I use Splunk. Uh, Splunk's great. It lets me take a whole bunch of logs and can bring them down into one simple dashboard, so I can do you know uh, relevant searches and stuff. So there's all kinds of tools out there that help make the job easier. You know, secure logins. I got, I've got hundreds of machines. Um, when I start talking about clients who've got close to thousands of machines, you know, I have to worry about the secure logins or attempted unauthorized logins on all of those machines. So I have to secure passwords across a huge environment. Um, and, and that's just one example. Configuration management, like I said, I've got, I've got lots of servers. So if you've got one machine, it's not a big deal. Two machines, okay, three machines, maybe. You start to get over maybe five, and if you're having to deal with this machine, then do, go and replicate that exact same behavior on the other machine, then do it again, you're starting, it becomes uh, sort of a headache. So there's all kinds of tools out there for solving some of these issues, right? And we're gonna discuss a couple of them. Change management is, is really bad in a lot of industries. Um, handling, a lot, like I said, a lot of systems can be a headache. And then in the event that something goes wrong, how do we fix it? Can we make that a little bit simpler? So we're going to talk about some of that. So passwords, man, everybody, how many talks have we been to at cons where somebody talking about password policies? Make them better, use passphrases. You know, it's, it's a failed system. Well, we need passwords in our environment. That's, that's, a, that's a given understanding that in an IT environment, you're going to have to have passwords. Um, but what are the problems with passwords? Well, primarily there's three real issues that I see as a systems administrator and that I've seen uh, going across the industry. Um, you know, I gave my OSINT talk for, for George's uh, workshop. Um, people have really bad password policies and people use really bad passwords, right? So as a systems administrator, it gets even worse because I don't just have to worry about my passwords, I have to worry about everybody's passwords, right? You have to do password audits, that kind of stuff. So. What happens as a systems administrator, really, when you get in an environment, I don't know how many people, how many you have in your environment. I you have four systems administrators that are responsible for your environment, 10, 15, 20, depending on the scale, right? So what happens is one of three things, typically. 
You use one master password that all the systems administrators know that works to every single machine. This is bad. That one, any one of those machines get compromised, that one master password now unlocks the keys to the kingdom in every single machine in the network. I mean, this is the whole concept on a penetration test. I got, I know, I have control of all of your network. Why? The other solution, have an individual master password, an individual root password for each individual situation. This is a terrible headache because what the administrators are going to have to do, they're going to write all those passwords down. They're going to have to have a book somewhere. You know, it has, oh, what's the password on that system? Well, let me go look it up. You've got to fix the problem now. I don't have time for you to go research an Excel document that may get compromised or, or, or this book that may have been lost or stolen in a physical uh, engagement or whatever. There, there's, that's a very serious issue of trying to have an individual password, all right? So there's other solutions. So, okay, so we don't want to have one. We don't want to have all. So let's try and segregate our network down, and maybe we've got this password, master password, root password, for example, or administrator password on, in a Windows domain for our DBA, for our database servers, and have this one for our web servers, and have this one for um, our workstations or whatever. So you've got some segregation in theory, and Somebody getting that root password to those machines, in theory, doesn't give them access to the other machines. Well, but there's probably another shared account that uses the same password. Once again, it's really bad. You've got to go back and do password audits. Where, why are we using that same password here? So while you may think you've segregated your network and said, okay, I've got this password here, but it doesn't, it's not on that machine. But the odds are that somebody can go in, a penetration tester or a malicious actor can go in and find another shared account that will get them access to one of those other machines. So again, passwords are necessary, but they're a problem. So like I said, so we've got weird password policies. And, uh, the obvious ones, the QWERTY, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, they always come up. Every time somebody does a password audit and does it and dumps it on, on Pasteman, for example, these, uh, these passwords um, pop up. Uh, Georgia's next door, but I wanted her to see this one. I put in here Georgia rocks for, <laughs> for the final one. So again, this is... Um, a serious issue in a lot of organizations. How do we deal with it? You know, um, is there a possible way that we can um, at least mitigate some of that where all of our administrators have to know the root password to all of our systems? Or can we find another solution? Configuration management. I work in an environment that has a, oh, I, I should have given a shout out to my employer. Like I'm a systems administrator for a company called MIE, Medical Informatics Engineering up in Fort Wayne. Um, fantastic company. So we have a web-based product, and uh, we deal with, with healthcare. So we support lots of hospitals, lots of doctors, offices across the, the country. We have corporate clients for our enterprise health, um, big ones that are uh, that are mentioned on our website, like Eli Lilly and Dow and, and Disney, where we handle uh, huge amounts of uh, healthcare data for a lot of clients, and we're in a lot of environments. So we have a lot. We have servers on site. We have servers at at client sites. Managing the configuration files for all of those machines can be a headache, right? I have to keep track of what's going on in this configuration file. How is it different for that machine? It may be slightly similar, but it may not. And any change that either accidental or malicious may cause serious headaches. So now I've got to go back and try and find out what happened, who did it. Maybe it was the other guy in my department made a typo, and now, you know, now that, that server's down, now something's not working. Along with that goes configuration sprawl. Like I said, I've got a lot of machines. I'll just give a sample of the Etsy folder here but on a Linux machine. But the idea here is that any one of these could cause me problems, and I don't have to deal with it on just one machine. I have to deal with it on hundreds of machines, right? So there are some solutions out there. I, I, I hope that you guys can see some of these slides. Um, if you were to Google con configuration management, you'd, you'd see some of these. So some of them are up there. I was, I was tasked um, by my employer to take a look at some of the solutions that were out there in the, in the workspace. We wanted to look at configuration management. How do we solve this problem? You know, we're an in-house development shop. We do all of our stuff custom. But when we do something, then it has to be replicated out to all of those machines, right? So if uh, one of our developers writes a script um, that needs to be pushed out to all the machines, all right, I'm going to log into this machine. I'm going to copy it to that one. I'm going to get it set up. Then I'm going to log into the next machine. I'm going to copy it over there. I'm going to get it set up. Then I'm going to log into it. This is a very time-consuming process, right? So how do we solve that? So I was tasked, take a look at Chef. Take a look at Puppet. Great. You know, I, I do some Ruby. I'll take a look at Chef and Puppet. These can't be too hard. Well, they end up being kind of a pain in the neck to figure out, right? So 
When I was tasked that project, another friend of mine that used to be on the CCDC team with me um, had taken a job at a company, and the Linux Journal magazine had came out with a solution. And it's like, oh, and he goes, take a look at this one. So we're going to come back and visit that solution in a moment. It's on this list. Um, uh, if you were to look at this list and uh, do some uh, inferring from my title, you might get a key. But we'll come back to that in a minute. But anyway, so there are some solutions out there for dealing with just configuration management. But the configuration management doesn't solve that issue of password complexity and the password stuff. And we're going to come back and show that there's a solution that actually helps them solve that too. Change management, that, that fourth thing I mentioned. If a, an administrator makes an authorized change to a system, and doesn't document it very well, how do I come back and find out what he did? How do I go back and reverse engineer and say, well, why did he make that change on this system, but we didn't make that change over here in this system? What, what do we do? You know, do we document this anywhere? Uh, was the change even authorized? Was it a malicious actor who's compromised my, my network and has gotten in and made a change to something that, um, obviously, they're not going to document why they did it. Um, so again, those come back to uh, key factors that in my job, I have to know. I have to be able to, to make some of those determinations. Server sprawl. So I talked about config sprawl. So there's server sprawl. So um, we've gone in our data center. We've, we've gotten smarter. We've conserved. Instead of having, let's go buy another chassis and another motherboard. So we do everything custom in our shop. Let's go buy another chassis, another motherboard, more hard drives, everything. Spin up a whole other machine. No, we've gotten smart. We've, we've switched to VMs. Having VMs doesn't make the sprawl less. It makes the... Uh, the capital overhead a little bit less, your power consumption is less, you know, your AC needs are less, you know, your, your actual size of your data center might be a little bit smaller, but you've still got just as many machines or more. And I say more because I'm in a dev shop and it's not uncommon for somebody to spin up another VM, to spin up another VM, to spin up another VM. How do you make sure those VMs have the proper configuration files on them? Goes back to that change management, you know, goes back to that config sprawl, you know, how do we make sure that that next VM they spin up has the right stuff on it, that it has the packages that we need, that we know that they're secure, that, that are the proper ones for operating in our environment. So that the next time I do a vulnerability scan, it's not, wait a minute, where did this machine come from and why, right? It's a very serious problem, which leads us to remediation. So something does happen, either accidental or malicious. Now I have to go back and do some forensics investigation. I got to go dig back through those logs and find out what happened, who did it, how do I fix it, right? I mean, a whole bunch of talks by a lot of people on, on, on this actual problem, incident response. It's a very big, very big and very um, important part of our industry. There's going to be an incident. Something as simple as somebody doing something on accident to something, somebody doing something on purpose. And even the accidents are still incidents, right? So in a lot of cases, somebody forgets to bring that pooper scooper to deal with the problem. Or like I said, maybe you were pwned. Maybe something happened, which makes it even more uh, important that you really find out what was going on. And in the course of a web-based company like ours, how do we make sure we're back up and running? How do we make sure we don't have a, uh, a, uh, a break in service? How do we make sure that those hospitals that need access to their data have access to their data right now? That they're not calling and saying, wait a minute, you know, we've got a patient in surgery and we have no access to their medical records. You know, for a company like mine, this is a very important and very valid point. So we have multiple layers of redundancy, but we need to make sure that in the event that X happens, we know how to fix it, or we have a way to fix it. All your data is lost. Have a nice day. <clears throat> so I've thrown up some kind of joking slides there and all that. So I want to get serious. I want to dig down into, okay, so how can I manage some of this stuff? Well, there's, there's, there's ways to do it, of course. There's, you know, you can do serious log management. You can write custom scripts. You can, you can say, okay, well, I've got to push out X number of files, so at, um, at 2 a.m., um, we'll run an R-sync on the network and make sure that everything, um, that we replicate this file to that file system and replicate this file to this. There are solutions for doing these things. What if there was a tool that made all of this a little bit easier, right? And one that let me do some of my security thinking as well. Seasoning. So going back to seasoning, properly seasoning your food, properly seasoning your network, making it a little more palatable. Well, there's a product out there called SaltStack that happens to be designed with just this thought in mind. How does a systems administrator go from managing five machines to 10,000 without having to do more work? 
being able to do the exact same thing they do for one machine and, ha doing, and doing it on a thousand machines all at the same time if that's what they need to do. How, what if they just need to do it to, um, maybe they've got a package that only works on 32-bit machines and they need to make sure it only gets installed on the 32-bit machines and the 64-bit version gets installed on the 64-bit machines. How do I manage that? How do I control it? How do I do it easily? How do I take some of that headache out of my day job? So Salt uses uh, um, uh, the premise of having a Salt master server and a group of minions. Um, I made a point down here that the master must run on Linux. Uh, there's a, a Salt master version for pretty much every Linux distro out there. Um, the agents themselves um, can run on anything, uh, Windows, Windows Server. Um, so while you can't have a Salt master server on Windows yet, um, uh, uh, don't be confused and think that these are the only operating systems that Salt will run on. Um, uh, if you run a particular distribution or operating system, uh, if you take a look at the Salt site, there's probably an agent that will run on that operating system. <coughs> Again, platform support. So Salt down here, um, does it support AIX? No. Um, uh, BSD? No. Um, or, or it supports BSD, but it doesn't support um, HP UIX. But it supports all the other, it goes all across to, to Windows. So when I was tasked with um, um, looking at Chef and Puppet, um, they were pretty good. They did, they did the same stuff, pretty much. Um, the key things here being, uh, uh, from a security professional, um, and uh, in my environment, was did it support my environment? Yes, they did. Okay, they, they all did, but it came down to ease of use, which one I felt the most comfortable with, which one, when I, when I was doing my testing work, set it up and boom, it goes, set it up and boom, it goes. Again, I need to make my job streamlined and, and important. As a systems administrator, um, when you do a task on, an environment, on a machine, typically, like, if I go and do something, um, any given thing, like, uh, the reason why the tools came out for monitoring logs and stuff, is if you do something once, fine. You do something twice, fine. If you've done something three times, you should have wrote a script because the odds are you're going to do it again. Automate it, right? So automate it. That's the concept. Automate this. So back to the secure logins, the first thing I mentioned, um, passwords. Crap. Well, here's what Salt does that Chef and Puppet don't. Salt allows for remote execution. So from the Salt server, I can execute a command on the Salt server and it will, well, I can, I can, run the command on the salt server. It will execute on the minion and bring me back the results. So it doesn't print, like if I was um, outputting a text file or a config file or whatever, it doesn't print out that config file on that machine. It doesn't print out the config file to a document on that machine if I was to output it to a document. It brings it back to me on that one salt server. This solves a lot of problems. All right, With the passwords thing, I don't have to give every administrator in my environment the root password to all of my machines. I don't have to give my tech support guys, if I don't want to, the root password to a machine. I can give them access to the salt server and use something like sudo so that I can track what commands they run and when and have them execute a salt command to do whatever they need to do to that machine, that target machine, log it through the sudo or spouse. I've got some security and some attribution of who did it, right? And they never have to log into that other machine. Salt does that for me. All right? So right off the bat, I've already solved one of my security administration headaches. Right? I don't have to worry about that password sprawl. I can literally have, if I wanted to, if I had a thousand machines, I could have a thousand unique passwords. Every server administrator doesn't have to have that book written down somewhere. If I have to, I can have one administrator or two in a, in a good proper environment so you've got um, some redundancy with that list maybe locked in a firebox someplace or a safe so that in the event that we actually need to physically access one of those machines, fine, we've got access to that password. But we, on a day-to-day -day basis, we've solved part of that password sprawl problem. So I've been asked, well, doesn't that mean if somebody compromises the salt server that now they've got access to all the keys of your kingdom like they would if they had that one master password? Okay. Make sure this is the machine that's the most buried deep inside your network. Don't put it on the perimeter. You shouldn't have any, you shouldn't have your domain controller on your perimeter. We've seen from like Wolfgang's talk, you know, about uh, threat modeling. These organizations have a domain controller that's right there available. Why? That's, that's stupid. So again, so you wouldn't want your salt server to be on the perimeter or easily accessible. Um, this, like I said, Chef and Puppet. Uh, 
They're designed for configuration management and change management, stuff like that. They didn't allow remote execution, which I, when I was doing my review, I was like, wait a minute. This is a very handy feature. It's a very important thing, and it solves some of my other headaches. You know, I don't have to SSH into this machine and, and go and, and try and find out what, what happened on this one. Or I don't have to SSH into that one. You know, now I'm, I'm using PuTTY or, or Emory mode or some other solution, and I'm going, okay, I jumped on this machine. I can do it from one machine, right? If I need to do query 10 machines at the same time, I can. If I need to query all of my machines, and now put that to a, a text file or an Excel doc or a, you know, an Excel document, so I can go back later and peruse that data and maybe do some, some data mining on it, I can. I can do it all at one, in one location. I have to go to each individual machine and output the data and then try and combine them all together and do it. I can do it, again, from one location. Ansible has some of this functionality. It has some other problems. That being said, here's this, um, from InfoWorld. World Magazine, they did a review. So I was recently asked by my boss to, we were uh, um, questioned about why didn't we use Ansible? You know, was there Ansible? So we had another guy do an, uh, another independent review. He, because I was biased towards salt, understandably, and I didn't, hadn't taken a look at Ansible. He went and looked at Ansible. Came back, and during this process, um, I was asked, why didn't I do Ansible? I said, well, you know, I, Here's my opinion. One of the, one of our developers, and our developer got involved in like, looking at some of this stuff too, right? One of our developers sent me this InfoWorld magazine, and so when the CEO asked me, you know, well, what about Ansible, Jim? I'm like, I didn't look at it, you know. Andrew's looking at that, but uh, I read this InfoWorld review right here, and uh, when they reviewed each individual product individually, and then they compared them, you know, a really decent review. I'm like. I agree with what they said about Chef. That, that's my impression, pretty much. I agree with what they said about Puppet. That's my impression. Yeah, what they had to say about Salt. That's my impression. I agree. I'm going to assume that what they say about Ansible, I would pretty much agree with too. Right. So no, I didn't take a look at Ansible. When the, when Andrew finished looking at Ansible, he came back and said, "No, Jim's right. We need to use Salt." So um, I, I I don't have anything really bad to say about Ansible. I would just say, you know. Uh, of the reviewers, I mean, uh, Puppet Enterprise gets a slightly higher score than uh, Salt Stack Enterprise. That has to do a lot with the industries that are typically using it. That being said, there are a lot of industries that are using Salt. You know, if you go to the Salt website, you find out people like Cisco are using Salt. Other ones, uh, people that are dealing with huge uh, lot of sprawl, are using Salt Stack. So that I'm not here to push Salt Stack. I'm saying there are solutions out there. This is the one I use and one that I highly recommend. And for systems administrators, if you need a tool, and if you're not using one. Now, you might want to examine uh, using one. Configuration management. So, with that configuration install, what I can do with salt, or Shepherd Puppet, what I can do with salt, is I can centrally store my configs on a one location, right? We already do this for backups, right? We have a backup copy of, of, of a configuration file. Hopefully, we've got a working backup of the configuration file. So, if something happens, we can restore it from the backup and get the device up and running. That was the premise of how. Um, historically, it's been done, and how we were doing it. So, how do how would we fix that? Well, if you have salt, you can essentially store your um, your configuration files and then push them out to the other machines. Now, there's two philosophies in the industry about push and pull. Um, Chef uses um, one, Ruby uses or uh, Puppet uses the other to push and pull. Um, push and pull means, uh, on the one hand, the server says this is what you're supposed to do, or this is what you're supposed to be here. The pull version, the machine goes, what am I supposed to do? Now, obviously, the better solution is push, because if the pull in the pull instance, if something goes wrong with that that machine out there, and it goes, hey, what am I supposed to do? And it can't reach the server. You haven't accomplished anything, right? So the push environment, or the push at least allows here. This is what you're supposed to be, and this is what you're supposed to be right now, right? Um, Martin Lawrence has a, a comment on uh, one of the websites that's been talking about salt. This says this is really as simple as one, two, three, configuration management. One, you have a top.sls file in in, um, in salt, and I didn't. I'm not going to be able to do my live demo. I did a lot of slides that I done my live demo more than once in practice, so I taken some slides. We're going to discuss some of this, but you'd have a top SLS file that specifies um, uh, what the environment might be. And in this one, he's specifying that it's a dev environment, and he's specifying in this case, um, uh, salt's really good at using regex expressions, so you can use things like the asterisk, the wildcard. It means anything. You can use one through five. A through Z, you know, you, you can use what you would use as a systems administrator in a regular expression to narrow down or widen your scope in situations as needed. So in this case, he's saying uh, it's a dev environment, minion anything.example.com um, 
is a MongoDB server. He goes down to state what is um, uh, the dev MongoDB server. So he has uh, in a slash in a dev a dev file directory a Mongo.sls that defines MongoDB is a package that's going to be installed. So in, on any machine that fits minion.example.com as a fully qualified domain name the word assault minion, it's going to get MongoDB installed on it. Any of them that match that, it's going to say install MongoDB on every single one of these machines. Um, and then um, to make sure that it happens, uh, he runs a command called salt um, whatever state dot high state. The dash v is a, a, the tack v is just a way to say give me as much of the of the uh, return results as you can. What's the status of of the ongoing process? Um, I'm going to go over some more of this in detail, but um, in this case, state dot high state says start at the top and give me all of the states that have to do with that machine. Change management. So like I said, so now we've got one location where we're doing our config file management for all of our servers. So you can have a slash dev environment, you can have a slash product production environment, you can have a slash test environment, you can call them whatever you want. And you can define what goes on in each of those environments. And you can do it in one location. So you can document it in one location. You can document it within those SLS files. You can have a comment that says, this is why I did this, this is the day that I did it. I mean, we have a, we have a, a, a process of work where um, uh, if somebody makes a change to something like a DNS record, um, we have to go in and comment why we did it and then commit that. So, you know, the same thing we do in our Git repository and stuff. Why did we do it and when? So there's some attribution. So you can do that same thing here. Say, why did that, why was that change made and who did it? So in the example I gave back to his, uh, his file, I go, this is, um, the chosen DB server. It was installed on, on this date. I did it. Um, um, the package is supposed to be installed. If we want to make any changes, they have to go through the DBAs first. You know, so and that's just a note there, so that the next person before they go do anything says, okay, you know. Um, and if they want to know who set this up, I've noted that I did it and when I did it. So you, it gives the people that are making changes in your environment a simple, can, easy place to do that, to document that, and so that when somebody wants to go and find out well who did it, they go and look in one location. Not, again, like somebody makes a change on this system and maybe they document it here and then, oh, I gotta go make that change over there and they go make the same change but that documentation that they did the first time is never replicated across those other times. Happens a lot. The multiple systems. I don't need to log into those other systems. Like I said, I only have to log into the salt server. But let's say I have 100 machines. How do I narrow down? You know, I just need to do something to machine X. Salt has some great functionality in it where I can do that through the use of grains and globs. So to explain uh, these grains here and, these, and the globs, so um, the grain is specified with a dash G. So when you're doing a grain, Salt has some native grains that they know, uh, like in this example, 64-bit architecture. So you just want to deal with just the machines in your environment that are 64-bit machines. The Salt minion knows what it is, what machine it's on, and so it can tell the server, the, the Salt server goes, hey, um, I need all the 64-bit machines to return me this information. And if it's a 30-qubit machine, it goes, well, I'm not a 64-bit machine, so I'm not going to answer that query, right? Uh, in this case, um, it's saying, any, all of my 64-bit machines, I want to know how many CPUs are on you. So is it a dual-core machine? Is it a quad-core machine? Eight cores? How many cores does this machine have? Um, this is a, uh, can be, in some instances, um, when you're trying to find out which machines for load balancing or whatever, uh, in a huge server sprawl environment, um, this, this could come in handy. Um, the next one is a is a is a glob. I'm saying um, web one through five. Uh, test up ping is a salt function. It's not like your normal ping where you okay ping that machine. Is there a network connectivity? The test up ping is the salt ping command where it actually queries the agent and says is my agent there and is it answering. So that's the test up ping. In this case, I'm saying I want web one, web two, web three, web four, web five to all respond whether or not they're up and responding to me. I don't care about web zero, I don't care about web six, I don't care about web 90, whatever. I don't, I don't care about anything that's not web. So if there's a dev or, or whatever, those aren't, I'm not querying those, I'm only querying the, the web one through five. So you can do globs, so you can do regex expressions and combine a lot of them together. And of course you can always use the, the wildcard character. So let's say I've got a bunch of CentOS servers, right? I need to find out what packages are installed in them for a lot of reasons. Maybe I need to do, I'm trying to do a package audit to make sure I don't have a vulnerable package installed on a system. 
Maybe I need to do it for um, another thing. Do, is there a system that's missing a package? Okay, uh, for some invariable reason. If I was to go to every single machine and do that, it could be very time consuming. Like I said, so I would do it from the salt server and I would collect all that data in one location and perhaps output it to a file so I can then manipulate that data at need. Maybe I need to create a report out of it. Maybe I just need to query it, you know, run a grep, a grep search against it to find out is this package installed in our network. Um, so in this case, I'm using a grain and I'm telling that I just want the CentOS systems so it won't query um, a Debian system, it won't query Ubuntu, it won't query Windows, it's only going to query my CentOS ones. It's going to run the command rpm-qa on those systems. So I'm not logged into those systems, salt is connected to them for me, and I'm going to actually execute a Linux command on that device from my salt server. And you can run, for the Windows ones, you can run PowerShell commands, and et cetera. And I'm going to bring that data back, and it's only going to be on my machine, the, the salt server that I'm located on, and I'm going to output it to a file so I can do something with it later. Again, this is very, very handy. The ability to do remote execution and get the data back right where you are um, when you're dealing with server sprawl and config sprawl is not only job easing, but it can be highly important when you're trying to track down um, uh, issues and finding solutions. Which brings me to remediation. So in the event that somebody has corrupted something, I have master copies of all of the stuff on my salt server that I need to push out. I only have to push them right back. Something gets, maybe one of the tech support people or maybe the other administrators or whoever logs into the machine, I can fix that and they make a change and now they've made it worse. Or they may have fixed one problem and maybe caused another. I can make sure that I enforce what the machine was supposed to be and what it's supposed to be doing from the salt server. I can say, no, push it right back out. Um, obviously, um, uh, there, are, there are caveats to this, and I'm going to touch on them. So you can do this through the use of a cron job. Um, like every hour, make sure my systems are exactly what they're supposed to be. Um, every five minutes, make sure they're what they're supposed to be. Um, but this isn't just config files. I'm going to talk about the fact that it actually, you can actually control exactly what files are on the systems. Not just the configs, I can control what my index.html file is supposed to be for my websites. So I can control what my Etsy password file is supposed to look like on uh, this machine and what it's supposed to look like on that machine. So if somebody comes in and tries to corrupt it and create a new user or do whatever, I can say, well, sorry, no, that doesn't exist anymore, boom, it's gone, right? I don't, I don't have to go and try and figure out, well, what change did they make? Um, I, I can enforce the authorized file. So I can tie this into my, uh, my HIDs. Now, um, I've given a talk a couple times on a product called OSEC, uh, which is the host-based IDS. So I've done, I've got, I go and I go, and when I say IDS, what does everybody say? And most people said snort. I've had other people come back and talk about some of the various enterprise levels. But a host-based IDS acts, monitors the system. So anybody familiar with like Tripwire, okay, that monitors the file system? So I could, I can tie in this into something like that that says, okay, a file on this system was changed let's change it back. Caveat there, it may have been an authorized change. It may have even been the salt server that made the change. If your host, if your IDS solution is watching for that change like that, it may try and, well, do the change again. If something changed. That, so I don't recommend automating that solution. You need to do, you may need to do some forensics analysis. Why did this happen? What did it happen? In the case of VMs, you know, make a snapshot of the image. Something's wrong with that server. Or make something's wrong with that workstation make a snapshot, segregate it, we'll come back and look at it when we can, but now in order to satisfy our client need or our business need, let's get that machine back up and running the way it's supposed to be, and we'll go and we'll do our forensics investigation afterwards. Um, so I, I don't recommend doing this um, on a heavily automated process. Um, there needs to be some, uh, some review, some buy-in. You, you need to make sure that you're aware of what's going on. You don't necessarily want SALT to just automatically be doing stuff. Why? There may be, you need, may need to investigate, well, why is SALT having to push back this same file every single day? What's going on? You know, what has happened in my environment that SALT's doing? So you need to have some kind of uh, management of it. SALT uses, like I said, the SALT server and the SALT agent. Um, Ansible doesn't, which is uh, one of the reasons why um, the uh, remote execution part of SALT works natively better. SALT also works a lot faster 
than Ansible does. So while they can do most of the same things, Salt has some speed benefits um, that go along with it. Part of that's due to the fact that they use ZeroMQ and MSPack MS -Pack to do their uh, communication. There is an alternative that's uh, been in alpha for a while, um, Salt SSH. So if you want to use Salt in an environment and the agent's not installed on that machine, you can still use some of the Salt functionality. They're adding to it constantly on, on, on a regular basis um, to do to execute remote commands and push stuff out to those machines. Anything doing with files that currently must be wrapped um, um, <coughs> in order to get the, those files over to the machines. It, it's a little bit slower. Uh, SALT has its own native encryption that it does at, in its process. Um, so if you wanted to use SALT SSH, so it's going to do its own native encryption. It's going to do, uh, and it uses AES, so it's going to do its own encryption. Then you're going to pass it to um, OpenSSL or, or some other SSH solution that you're using. It's going to do more encryption on top of that, which is more CPU overhead. It's going to make the packets even bigger. It's going to slow the process down. There's some testing. If you were to go out and, and uh, watch some of the videos, if you look up some salt, uh, some other salt talks and some other videos, they, they show some testing of, of what they've done with salt SSH. And they go and run a command using the salt agent on 100 machines. And they get the results back in like five seconds. They run the same command over salt SSH on 100 machines, and it takes like two or three minutes. So there is an exponentially longer time when you add in that additional CPU overhead and the additional packet size and, and you're dealing with networks. It, it, it can mean um, a little bit more of a burden. That being said, I was asked, well, can you use SALT SSH to then install the SALT agent on another machine? Well, yeah, if you've got working SSH credentials on another machine, you could use SALT SSH to connect to that device and then install SALT so now you can go and, and use the agent. A very good idea of how to get salt installed on a machine that doesn't have it on it already. So securing traffic and defending the castle. So the, the idea is, like I mentioned, if somebody compromises a root password that's spread across your envir entire environment, or they compromise one machine and there's a shared credential on that machine that goes to another environment, this solves, salt obviously solves part of that problem. All the traffic between a server and a minion, of course, are encrypted. They're using AES encryption. Only an accepted minion will communicate with the server. This is uh, important. And someone asked, well, why would you even make that comment? Well, if anybody's ever had to deal with like a rogue uh, AP uh, in their environment, uh, somebody comes and plugs in a pineapple in your network or a, a pony plug or something, um, the idea of having a, a rogue device in your network that you're unaware of is a very it's an important security concern for us, right? Well, the same thing, you don't want somebody to be able to say, well, I'm going to install the salt agent on my machine, and I'm just going to tell that server that, hey, here I am, you know, here's these domain names, you know, uh, minion whatever, you know, that, that Martin Lawrence had, minion asterisk. That, well, I'll just create my machine and give it that, that uh, FQDN and call myself um, minion50 at example.com, and the next time they run their high state command, it'll push all that stuff to me, and now I'll have all of their stuff. No. Because the only way a the salt server will talk to one of the machines is if the a if that agent has been approved. So when the agent starts up and you go you go into the minion and you tell it well, this is the server that I talk to, this is the server that I'm willing to communicate with. Somebody has to go on the salt server and say, okay, yes, that is one of my trusted minions. It doesn't automatically become trusted. There's not an automatic trust. It has to be specified, um, which is actually pretty simple too. This is where I want to do my live demo, and my, my VMs are acting up. I apologize for that. So I'm going to try and, and walk through what I would have done in my demo with some of my slides. So installing salt is very, very simple. I've been asked, how long does this take to install? Depends on how fast you can type. Depends upon how fast you can copy and paste. Depends on what salt stack has on their, um, on their documentation pages, um, what they call their uh, um, one-liners. We've got one-liners for a, a bunch of different uh, operating systems, a um, bunch of different methods. Um, these are a couple of them that I, I, I would typically use. First one uses curl, goes out and downloads a bootstrap, bootstrap strip that does all the work for you. Um, you can do the same thing with GitHub. Um, you can even do the same thing for the master. So the first two commands up there are downloading and installing an agent. And the one down on the bottom is doing the same thing for a master. Um, so literally, you type in this command, Boom, hit enter. It goes out, runs over to SaltStack's GitHub site, downloads the bootstrap, and does all of the installation for your operating system, whatever that operating system is, and installs it for you. You don't have to worry about the dependencies. They take the, 
from, like I said, from most of the operating systems, they've solved all of that for you. They're going to install the necessary packages to make it work, and it's going to set it up so it communicates. That being said, <coughs> one of the problems that's in the install, that um, there's some discussion, can we fix this? And they're like, yeah, we'll fix it. When you run this command and you do the install, it starts the salt menu. You haven't configured the salt menu yet. It doesn't know where its master is. So typically right after the install, you would go in and kill that process, kill the kill the minion, then go edit the, the minion file that adds the salt minion, and give it the IP address or the fully qualified domain name of your salt master, then restart the minion. I would have shown a, a, a little bit. I would have shown the, the kill, kill it and then restart it. And then once you restart it with so that it knows where its master is, you go over to the master and run the command um, salt key dash L. So list all the machines that are trying to talk to me. Um, and you would see one that says, this is an unauthorized device. And you would say, okay, well, yeah, that's my machine that I just tried to connect. So you do a salt key dash A for, for accept, and then give it that IP address or that FQDN of that minion. And once you tell it, yes, I accept this machine, then they can establish communication. Once again, that goes back to the fact that you can't have a rogue machine, well, unless you had some systems administrator that was trying to be a malicious actor, and, uh, you know, an insider threat. It was authorizing the machine, but you've mitigated some of that uh, some of that issue right at the top. Here I am in a in, in the uh, in the master. I've gone in. This is a very simple config file. Anybody's ever dealt with a, a Linux config file for um, pretty much anything? Set up the same way any of them, any other ones are. Here I've told the master that I intend to listen on that IP and only that IP. So maybe I've got a device that has um, four Ethernet ports, or more than four Ethernet ports, or maybe I've got multiple NATs on my device so that I've, um, like one of my web servers is actually listing on 15 IPs um, instead of one. On this one, I'm telling on this machine, I just want Salt to listen on this interface, right? So I don't care if some other rogue traffic tries to talk to me on another interface to my Salt server. It's never gonna, I only want to listen on one. I'm a firm believer in whitelisting and, and limiting which devices can talk to which devices. So in this case, I'm telling my master, listen on this interface. I go down further, and I'm going to touch on some of this. Um, Salt runs its own simple file server um, that lets it keep track of what you're doing. So they have here, they've got some examples of how they set up some environments. So you can have your own base environment. You can have a dev environment. You can have a production environment. You can call it, you can develop, have a, one called QA. You can have one called um, fun time. Whatever you want to call your environments, you can call them what you want. And you can set up where Salt should expect to find files. So when a minion needs something, where do I start looking in the file system? Kind of like a, a true rooted environment. Where am I locking down this file system? So it's not like those minions are going to pull a file from the, the master's own configs. It's only going to pull them from this file system that you've, you've designated. Um, in this case, for the demo, I've set up a, a base environment that just starts at SRV salt. <coughs> if I go into that SRV salt, I'm going back to those SLS files. There's, um, I was doing some stuff with cups. Um, I wasn't going to demo that. It's in there. So I've got my top SLS, and then I've got um, a subdirectory called web server. If I look inside of top SLS, and by definition, when you first start, you have to have a top. That's where, I mean, salt's going to work down the stack. So it's going to start at the top. So you would have to have a top, defining what the top is. And in this case, I defined um, uh, two minions, um, uh, salt minion one and salt minion two. Salt menu one, I was doing stuff with web server. Salt menu two, I was going to do some stuff with cups. So on salt menu one, I've defined web server. And so well, web server, well, there's a subdirectory up there for web server. Well, right. So what I've said here is whenever I run a high state command, salt would, or, and there's other states you can run, but high state's the top one, the very, the very, very, the widest one. Um, if you really want to get involved in this, yeah, take a look at salt and see that you can get, you can get very explicit in what you do. But it starts at the top. So say, do I have a machine that matches salt minion one in my environment? Yes. What do I need to apply to it? Do I have a thing in salt minion called salt minion two? Yes, I do. What do I need to apply to it? I could have had base and then web servers, um, file servers. You can step down this as in the hierarchy as to the degree that you need to. And it, again, it puts it in one easy location so you can manage all of them. Um, I was trying to demonstrate this um, in a pretty simplistic manner to give so it wouldn't be um, too over the top. So if we take a look at what's going on in the web server, so well, yeah, salt menu one, it's a web server. So what is a web server? Well, if we go to the web server directory, we'll see there's an index.html and an 
and init.sls. So your, your base of your file system must have a top. That's where salt, so salt knows how to, where to start at. Below that, whenever you go into a new environment, you init that environment. You initialize it, right? So in my init.sls, I specify, well, here's what a web server is in my environment. It must have Apache. In a CentOS environment or an RPM-based environment, that's HTTPD. In a Debian-based environment, it would be Apache 2. So I could even specify, is this, this operating system, install this one. Is this, this operating system, install that one. Salt will let you do that. So you don't have to worry about, well, now I've got to have a whole separate one. No, you can specify this, uh, this operating system environment, do this one. This operating system environment, do this one. Um, again, this was going to be a, a pretty simple demo just to give an idea of where to start at. So in this case, um, it says, okay, for a web server, it has Apache. What is Apache? Well, it's a package. Okay, it's a package. It needs to be installed. If, it, if it's a new machine or, or something happens to a machine and that, that package isn't there, Apache is gone, let's make sure it's installed. Let's go to the repos. Let's get it. It can be our own repo. It can be the public repo. Where, let's go get that package. I mean, and you can define that um, in your environment. So it's also a service. And because it's a service, we need it up and running. We need that web server up and running. Um, and this next part is uh, not a completely necessary part, but it's recommended in the SALT documentation for, for um, ensuring that things happen properly. If I had forgotten to put the package installed up there, I can say the service that's running, it requires this package, Apache, and it reiterates that package needs to be there. You can't have the service up and running without the package. Um, you'll also notice there's an index.html in, in that uh, web server definition. Um, so that index.html says, well, here's uh, um, var www.html index.html, and it's a file that I want managed, and it needs to come from my, my salt server, so under serve salt, and then it needs to go from web server index.html. What this is saying is on any machine that matches the web server definition, in this case right now, just salt menu one, that file, var www.html index.html on salt minion one must be the file that's located at web server index.html, this file up here. The one I have on my salt server must be the one that exists on that machine. If, if it doesn't match, if something's happened to that file, replace it with the known good working one I have right here. Um, and again, um, uh, this requires Apache. So, um, how does, how does that have to, to work with my machine? So if I, if I look inside the index.html, you notice I, did, I created a simple HTML file for my demos. It just says that um, I created the file and revised it back on 22 May um, so that in the event that something happens, somebody browses to that website, if it doesn't look like that, let's put the right one back, right? <coughs> well, so you get on salt meaning 2 when you fire up the web browser. And you go to 1.1.2, which is supposed to be salt menu uh, 1, and the web server is not up and running. Right? Can't connect to it. Um, you go on salt menu 1, I do a, a check and see the Apache status. Apache stopped. It's not even up and running. Um, I also show that um, uh, um, I'm currently in. Um, bar www HTML, and I checked the date. I, I, I did the dates and times because I want to show that I was, this was, I was doing this as a, as a working thing. So it wasn't like I did something, oh, oh, hey, I'll go back and edit this. And I, this was the way it was working two or three days ago. Um, so I wanted to let you guys know that there are dates and times on these so you can see the sequence of events where I, where I, I showed these things. And you'll see down there I also tried to uh, not just use the web browser, but I tried to curl um, index.html from uh, salt menu one, and I wasn't getting a response. The web server is not there. So I jump over on the salt master and I say um, salt minion one or salt salt minion one whatever high state you know state dot high state and it says okay well I go and look at salt minion one Apache's installed that that match is true Apache is there um, it wasn't running so we're gonna make it run so we started it we started Apache now it's up and running um, the file was not there um, or we managed this file yes we managed that file right. Um, it wasn't there, let's make it be there. So you'll notice it says, um, 
diff, the diff is it's a new file. The file did not exist. Let's put it there. Um, and the mode for that file, um, for return purposes, um, what the statuses are, who has permissions, you know, for, for user groups, etc. And it tells me it succeeded at all three things with, with no errors. Um, I then go and do another git command to show that I had just done this right after um, the, the previous example. So <clears throat> I go back to salt menu one and I do a date to show that it's a few minutes after the other one. I check the Apache status, Apache's up and running. I do a curl of my local host with index.html. There's that, there's that HTML file exactly as it looked over on my salt master in that web server definition. I jump over to salt menu two, pull up the web browser, there you go. It, it pulls down, yep, that's, that's what the website's supposed to look like according to my definition. And I, uh, I curl it to show that, um, again, the same thing. <coughs> So the, the situation there was the, ser the server wasn't up and running. There was no working web server, right? Not only was there no working web server, but the, um, the HTML code for that website didn't even exist on that machine. If you had even started the Apache server, big deal. It would have been empty content. It wouldn't have been the right content. Um, with one simple command, I did three things. I made sure Apache was installed. I made sure it was up and running. And I made sure that the, the right and valid content was in existence with one command. <coughs> so, okay, so, hmm, let's be a malicious actor or an accidental. So I go in, go back over and on salt menu one, and I go in and I edit, I go in with Vi, and I edit it, so now it says I corrupted it for the demo. All right, this is gonna be the wrong HTML code. Anonymous just came in and defaced me, or some, some other accident, or some other, some other thing. And you go, I go to the, the browser on salt menu two, and I show you that when you browse to that now, somebody defaced my website. Trying to find that defacement, maybe it, way down in your CSS, or way down in your JavaScript, or way down in your PHP, or maybe it's a redirect, can be a very time consuming process. I need to get my server back up and running, I need to get it back up and running now, and it needs to have my content. So for forensics purposes, I would make a copy of that, the, the existing state of the web server, back it up, whatever, and then restore from, with salt back to my working environment as fast as possible so I'm my, my clients, my business are doing business, and I can go back and do my forensics investigation afterwards. Without a tool that manages your configuration files, you have to take that server down and segregate it and go back and do your forensics analysis. So maybe it's out of, uh, out of service for X amount of time. Or you just say, just get it back up and running and forget the forensics analysis. This, this method allows me to get it back up and running quickly, and a smart administrator would make a copy of, of whatever is wrong so I can go back and do the analysis later. When I run the state.high state after the file was corrupted, the salt server goes back. Remember before it said it was a diff and it was a new file, right? Okay, it was a new file. I just installed it. That's fine. So what Salt did now when I ran the state of high state is it said, yeah, that's a file. We manage it. Um, this is where it's supposed to be. We updated it. We put the right version back on that machine. Not only does it tell me that it put the right version back on the machine, it shows me where the difference was. It will compare what it was before, what the, what the deface value was or the, or the incorrect information was, and what the new version, the, the right version that I placed it with, what that change was within, within that file. And again, it succeeded, and I showed that this would happen um, many minutes after me corrupting it. And if I browse back to that website, it's back to being the right way. Again, dates and timestamps and everything uh, to show that this was a working. I wanted to do this on the fly for you guys, but uh, I had the same problem when I did this talk for my job on Thursday. They're like, oh, you're giving this talk? Can you give it to us? You know, we use this in an environment, but my, my our DBAs and, and the C-suite, they knew we were doing stuff, but they didn't know what we were doing or how it worked. They just knew we were doing it, so they wanted me to give this talk. So in summary, going back to what I said, were the five big issues that I see and that, uh, that others that I've talked to have seen as systems administrators, the problems that we're dealing with, are managing who's touching our servers, when, and why. And are they doing it securely? Do I have good password policies? Do I have... Do I know who's touching my systems and when? Do I have a person that's touching my machines after hours? We, we use tools to manage that kind of stuff. This allows me to have, I don't care who you are, you can't access that machine unless you have access to the salt server. And by doing that, it's essentially located. I'm not having to check secure logs 
on 50 machines on a daily basis to find out who did what, right? I still have to do that, but this uh, I shouldn't have a secure log filled with hundreds of logins, for example. I should have, and if I do, they're probably the malicious attempts, not the, not the valid logins. It allows me to centrally control my configurations and manage them in a cohesive and simple manner. It allows me to do some change management. I can document it in one location. Uh, revision control can be a very big uh, issue. I, I'm in a software development environment. The revision control is going on all the time. What changes did we make? Why did we make it? Come on, where do we need to roll back to in the event that uh, we find out that something didn't work? Where, what were our steps to take to get here? So can we roll it back? Um, handling multiple systems, like I said, through the use of grains and globs, I can control all of my network at once, or I can control just a segment of my network. I can specify just which machines I need to deal with. Um, and then it allows me to do some remediation in the event that something happens. I can make sure my machines, my services, my files are back the way they need to be as quickly as possible without trying to find out, well, what the heck happened? What did they break? You know, segment that machine, make a copy of it, make a snapshot, get the working version back up and working, and we'll do our analysis afterwards. I want to thank you guys very much. I want to thank Circle City Con for, for allowing me to come here and talk. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, this is my contact information. I like to point out to uh, people uh, quite a bit that uh, um, if you're at a con, most of us who are speakers, when we put our Twitter handle up there, it's a actual invitation. We're not saying don't contact us. We're saying feel free to contact us if you would like. Um, that's my personal email address. George Joseph, why don't you put your James at Bob Security email address up there? Um, that's my personal email. I can tell people that's not my work email. It's not my day job email. It's not my Gmail account. It's not my Hotmail account. When I fire up my desktop and I open up my email program, that's the one it pulls the email from. So I, I, if you have any questions or you have want, uh, more information or whatever, that email address actually reaches me uh, four or five times a day checking that email. So that's... Uh, uh, if you want to talk to me, feel free. Um, that's my personal website. Like I said, I do stuff for my community. Um, uh, I try and be a InfoSec evangelist about fixing the other issues in our industry. Um, our, my, I like to tell people, my security perimeter isn't my firewalls at work. It's not even my firewalls at my client sites. My security perimeter is global. I mean, unfortunately, I have to worry about the actions of every single possible person on the planet at the end of the day because they may touch my networks. They may touch my clients' networks. They may touch my family's networks. So security is not just something I, I, uh, I work in. It's a field that I believe um, a lot of us in the industry, we want to fix the problems, but we can't do it alone. So that's my contact information. Again, I, I appreciate you guys being here. And I hope that I've at least given you an idea of a way to solve some of the headaches in your environments. Any questions about SALT or? I suppose you you could um, have a conflict. Um, I can't I can't think of what one might be off the top of my head, um, where perhaps you had defined a machine um, as both a web server and a file server, and so you're having it do manage this file from like in your web server definition you said manage this file here, and then in the file server when you said manage the same file but bring it from here, that would be a pretty strange conflict, but it would be possible. It would step down the state, so it would read the top one first, and it would execute that one. It would go down to the next one, and then, well, I don't know what we did up here, but this one says replace it with this one down here, so this is what I'm going to go. Um, that goes down to trying to do some really good change management and really good documentation of what you're doing and why. Again, it allows you to do it in one place. You don't have somebody going, well, I installed it here. I, this is the file. And then somebody else comes over later and goes, nope, that's the wrong file. Let's put this file here. Or, or, or this, we're not running that service. We're running this one. Uh, we're not installing um, uh, PHP 5.2. We're installing PHP 5.5, for example, on our machine. You know, whatever the case may be here. Why are we running that? Let's, let's run this. It allows you to, to again, uh, consistently manage those things from one location. 
So, um, yeah, there, if there was a conflict, it would always go with the latest one. So, or the last defined one. Anything else? Thank you very much and happy Father's Day.